And today's session is presented by uh, Neil Krasnoff, who is a school librarian down in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Neil has worked with us before um, on the PD series last summer. He was actually one of the very first people that we had join us as part of the professional development series. Uh, and we are really excited to have him back on board presenting with us again. So without further ado, uh, Neil, um, I will pass it off to you. And if you have any questions, um, both Jeff and I are on the line if you need us. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. Um, I, it's great to be back with EasyBib Professional Development. Um, I really enjoyed last year, and I hope to do at least as well as I did last year. Um, the topic I'm doing today is called uh, Using Images in Research, and really I don't want to present myself as a, an expert on this subject. Um, what it does reflect are, is a year of work. Um, this past year I did spend quite a bit of time uh, instructing students in different classes about images licensing and searching for images and, and so forth. So a lot of what you're seeing here in this presentation are things I've actually tried out uh, with classes, but it's by no means a comprehensive uh, approach to the topic. Um, it's just one I hope it will uh, provoke some thinking. Um, I really encourage people to uh, participate via chat and also share uh, your own thoughts and ideas, um, you know, even if they contradict um, what, I'm, what I'm saying. Because again, my experiences might not be reflective of your experiences. So, um, so with that uh, in mind, just don't uh, feel shy about um, interrupting with the chat comments, and I think Emily will, will moderate those for me. Okay, so onward. I'm coming to you live from Dallas, Texas, which uh, is famous for lots of things. Uh, but uh, we're really proud of the music scene here, uh, which goes back quite a while. Um, one of our bands, uh, Lee Harvey and the Whalers, um, you know, played a famous you know, jail concert in the Dallas County Jail in 1963. Uh, that's five years before you know, the famous Folsom Prison concert by uh, Johnny Cash. So am I getting any comments out there yet? Uh, so far, not yet. Uh, some people are still getting adjusted with their audio options, um, but uh, nothing yet, Neil. I'll let you know uh, if we have some comments coming in. Okay. Well, I, I was hoping to get, you know, people would, you know, chime in because this is kind of an, a little bit of an outrageous claim I'm making on purpose. But um, okay, so you probably may recognize that this image was uh, not a, a concert, um, that it actually is Photoshop. Um, I, just so you know, like I said, I, I, everything I did here, uh, I, did, I used for classes. And in Dallas, obviously, it was the 50th anniversary of the uh, Kennedy assassination. And one thing you'll be happy to know is that most of our students um, did not believe this, uh, you know, photoshopped uh, thing was really, in fact, um, knew where this image came from, that it was, in fact, the famous Pulitzer Prize winning photo of uh, the assassination of Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, we, uh, we've uh, had a couple people uh, chiming in just saying that it's kind of a crazy picture, interesting manipulation, um, so on and so forth. So they were able to, uh, to pick up on it, of course. Okay, good. And you know, like I said, our, our high school students were, were savvy enough to um, do it. But what I was curious about in, in talking to the classes was really how do you know it's fake? And um, it's just a good question to ask. And I got a lot of different theories. A lot of which, um, you know, they could like to talk about shadows and, uh, you know, visual uh, things. And uh, if they knew that there's a, a really a tasteless element to the picture, the, the Dead Kennedys um, band logo is in the background of the Photoshop image, which of course is, you know, very tasteless. I don't think anyone caught that. Um, but just the preponderance of evidence of, you know, historical evidence of, you know, which is correct is really what I was hoping they would. Uh, think of, but actually most of them did not, most high school students weren't thinking in terms of the historical record or, you know, knowing people that were alive at the time and can verify, you know, which photo was authentic. Um, but they did have their theories and again, they were able to te detect uh, forgeries. And I think, um, so one thing I'm not too concerned about, is our students are, are used to Photoshop, they're used to memes. Um, so they have their ways and their strategies for, for detecting fraudulent kind of photos. Um, so. Um, you know, but that's, so that's not where I think the whole need is. So um, what I do think there is, um, you know, a need for is really the students need to understand that there's a lot of, of ethical concerns. Um, and, you know, it, when is it appropriate to do a Photoshop 
of, of a picture. Um, in the case of the famous picture we just saw, um, there, there are uh, there's some questions. Um, well, I, was able, I was actually researching this right before I put my slideshow together. And um, what I found was actually a good source is, uh, is uh, Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia has an excellent um, licensing information about each photo that's in Wiki, Wikipedia, or Wik they call it Wikimedia Commons. I'm going to be mentioning this quite a lot throughout the presentation. Um, but I don't know if you can read this on your screen, but what I have here is a screenshot of the Wikipedia um, information about the original Lee Harvey Oswald uh, you know, assassination picture, which was uh, by Bob Jackson. Um, um, what I did find out that was that it, the original image is owned by the Associated Press currently. The newspaper that Bob Jackson worked for is out of business, and the rights are owned by Associated Press. Um, that the, the full rights of the original, the, I should say, the full resolution image is not um, available for free use. But it seems like a Photoshop that we just saw is actually. Uh, would fit um, because it's transformative of a nature and it's not um, really speaking to directly talking about the Kennedy assassination. So uh, there's a lot of uh, complexity, um, and I think this image illustrates the complexity about um, images because there's there's so many different rights and restrictions and um, and so forth. And it really you need a good source uh, for how to find the you know the image. And and one thing I do think is that you know Wikipedia is in fact excellent. Uh, for that, and this, this is an example of how it's useful. Okay, so that, that was just sort of an introduction to um, some things I've done. Uh, I want to kind of give you an overview of what we're talking about today. Um, first of all, I want to really talk about the why. Um, why even really teach about ethical use of imaging? Um, and I'll get into the why I'm even asking the question. Um, I've came across a lot of misconceptions. Um, particularly on the part of teachers, and the teachers' misconceptions were therefore more of a problem because they were teaching the students a lot of things that were, were problematic. Uh, and so I'm, what I'm saying are presenting misconceptions that I observed in my, in my practice. Um, again, they may not be the same as, as what you have seen. Um, the body of the presentation, I think that's going to be the most interesting to most people are um, some tools about citing, or, or I should say, locating images uh, that really help cite you properly with the correct uh, attribution and licensing information. And um, and again, we'll be looking at different tools like Google, Flickr, and uh, Wikimedia um, in a little bit of detail. And and lastly, what I really, I kind of answered the first question: Why bother teaching ethical use? Because the really the bigger picture is that we really want our young people to be mindful of what they're doing online, to really think about what goes on behind it and don't just mindlessly copy uh, things without, you know, giving credit. Okay, so these are some statistics. Again, why bother um, teaching uh, ethics when it comes to images when 90% of all Creative Commons photos are not attributed at all? I mean, these are from bloggers, bloggers that use pictures don't generally attribute their images. Uh, and, and so the study that I'm citing really looked at, at websites and blogs and, and concluded that 90% were not attributed. And those that are, of those that were attributed, most of them weren't done correctly. Um, they, would, they didn't have the right linking and licensing information attached to them. So really almost nobody is doing image citation correctly, virtually nobody, and those that are doing it correctly are probably associated with schools or more colleges. Um, so why even bother? Uh, you know, when the, the problem is so rampant, it's become acceptable for, for most people to just take and use. Okay, so this is an actual teacher I worked with who is instructing our freshman class. Uh, I was talking to him about doing a lesson about this very topic a couple of years ago. And he was adamant that, that it was absolutely not worth his time, that we're in education, we can use whatever images we want, and it doesn't matter if we give credit or not. I, and he, I, when, he, uh, when I argued with him, I said, no, he said, I went to a workshop and that's what they told me. So I'd be curious to know if you think this really is a misconception out there or this just happens to be uh, what I've experienced. And maybe you, maybe you have, um, teachers or professors that you work with that 
that don't um, believe this, but in my case, I had to overcome this viewpoint from the teacher before I could actually get in front of a class and, and try to rectify it. The truth uh, Neil, the there are some interesting, uh, just wanted to add a comment that had come in. Um, Debbie said, uh, we had a faculty uh, teacher, uh, uh, faculty member teaching students to put in their search string for Google images rather than any uh, sort of real attribution. Um, others are saying, I have teachers tell me there's no need for students to cite anything. Um, and Ian says, does your teacher also play baseball uh, broadcast without express written consent? Um, lots of comments coming in about that. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, actually the guy's a big Boston Red Sox fan, so um, yeah, I'm sure he, <laughs> he uh, does that. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I, it's good to know that I'm not the only one that encounters this problem. So again, if it's, it's a problem with the teachers, then I think you know, it's going to be obviously a bigger problem with students, um, and it's harder to obviously do much instructionally if you don't have the teachers on board. Um, okay, so one of the misconceptions I'm going to addressing is that that educational use means that there's really no need for attribution. Um, I think that's a, a popular belief on the part of educators in, in around the country. Um, the reality is that that when you look at Creative Commons licensing, that the the most liberal license that most people use is an attribution license. Um, there is, in fact, a, a common um, license for no rights that people have to, con they have to actually waive their rights and make it public domain. There is a Creative Commons designation for that, but most people don't use it. Um, so really, when it comes to education exemptions, that there are, uh, in, there are organizations that, that, that specifically allow for educational exemptions, and those happen to be a lot of organizations that are involved in education. Um, so, for example, National Geographic is, uh, is an education organization that, in fact, specifically uh, designates educational use in their license information. So what I've done here is I just copied and pasted some of the National Geographic language about uh, educational purposes. That it, it's on their um, website under the, uh, you know, the terms of use. Um, so you have to read through all the legalese and you can find that there is, in fact, um, you know, special things granted to uh, educators uh, about downloading and reusing the images. Um, but again, but they all, they still do not um, mean that they, you can't, you shouldn't have tribute. They in fact want attribution. If you look at, we're going to look at some examples of, of National Geographic and they have very, very specific requirements for attribution um, in which I tried to follow in this presentation. Okay, so misconception two is that, I, that a lot of teachers, I think, uh, and a lot of students really, believe that if it's on the internet and you can right click and save it, that it, it is public domain and it's free. Um, but the reality is that, I think you know this, that, that if it's uh, online um, and it's, you know, there is a creator of that image, that it is licensed pretty much automatic. Even if there's no licensing information, it is copyrighted uh, by the creator. It, it's sort of an automatic uh, thing and so we what we really don't want I think misconception two is the most important uh, to fight that really just because it's on the internet it's not the public domain and um, now a, a few websites will restrict their images from being downloaded in fact the um, the Lee Harvey Oswald assassination picture um, is very tightly controlled on, on most websites um, so you know, here's a quote, uh, as I mentioned, Wikimedia Commons is, is an incredibly rich source for licensing information about photos. And this is a quote from their uh, disclaimer. Again, I, they do a lot of um, diligent work about, uh, about their photos and, uh, and they try to research about you know, uh, the owner of the rights license and give you information about it. Uh, and a lot of them, a lot of them are in fact public domain photos. But Wikimedia does have a disclaimer that uh, that a lot of these uh, licenses are there are restrictions on a lot of these licenses, um, and um, and that um, and that you you have to often find the original license um, to to attribute and, and it should of course be attributed. So this is from Wikipedia, um, and again I, I, you can take a look at the, uh, at their source if you haven't already. Um, okay, misconception three is that there's really a similarity between royalty-free and public domain. 
Okay, I'm, I'm thinking that probably some of you know that royalty-free is really um, a term that's, that's used by stock photo companies. Um, so the largest stock photo companies are Getty, Corbis, uh, and so forth. They, these are companies that, that charge uh, for their stock photography. Um, and really what you're paying for is the right to reproduce it in a limited or unlimited way. But it's certainly not public domain. I mean, in fact, they're really two very different terms. I think most librarians and educators are probably familiar with what public domain means, you know, works that are not uh, protected by copyright. But really, the terms are really far apart in their meaning and, and use. Um, so uh, one thing I've done is um, I was particularly embarrassed when some of our students were using, oops, I just went, I, I want to get back to that slide. Um, I had to show them what a watermark is, and this is a stock photography um, thing. Oh, I have the timings on. I don't really want that. <laughs> but uh, so the, I had to show them, like, this is a watermark, and if, if you see this, you definitely should not use it in your presentation. That's definitely a stock photography um, a trademark. Okay, so the, um, the things that we want students to know. Okay, I've kind of covered a little bit of that, but um, since students really have lots of needs and they have um, a lot of probably misconceptions, what I think is, and, and, been, and that we only have so much time to talk to them as librarians, uh, that um, the most helpful information to teach them are, I think, these three things. Um, they need to know when, that, you know, when you should cite uh, a picture and um, how to cite it. Um, and I try to be, you know, a little more liberal than I am with myself about using images. Um, and they also really need to know how to search for uh, Creative Commons licensed images and things that are legal for them to use and reuse in their projects. So obviously there's a lot we can do there to be helpful in a short amount of time. Um, I'm hopefully going to show you some things that you didn't know about some search tools. Um, but we'll go onward. Okay, so basically when it comes to when to cite and when not to cite, um, there's really a lot of, you know, a lot we could really talk about. What I tried to do on this slide was really simplify it into two categories, one being um, clip art and stock photos, which again, uh, the clip art I'm using here comes from Microsoft and it does not require a citation. It does require that I purchase the software of Microsoft legally to use it, um, and that the clip art, uh, actually both those are, both the stock photos and the clip art are from Microsoft. And I, you know, since I have the software, I'm licensed to use it and to use it without attribution. Uh, so again, that's a, a good way to encourage uh, stock photo use um, because it doesn't require the attribution. Now, pretty much everything else, um, especially anything that's listed as a Creative Commons licensed image, should definitely uh, be cited and they should be cited in careful accordance with, with the license restriction. Um, and it's a, it, in my opinion, um, this is a value judgment I made when I was talking to the students that really the, the thing you should do is at least know the photographer's name and to put the photographer's credit um, in the picture. And that really applies whether or not if it's a public domain image or not. Um, you know, I think it's just good to know, like, the students should know that Bob Jackson won a Pulitzer Prize for the assassination photo of Lee Harvey Oswald, and it's just good to know that photographers are real people and they help make history. Um, so knowing the photographer's name, I think, is really half the battle. Um, it, it requires a little bit more thought and research. And so when, I came, when it came to my uh, instructions to them, I just said, really, just give, a, give us the link to the picture and the name of the photographer, and that's at least good enough since they weren't doing anything prior to that. Okay, so there is a full citation for MLA or other means for pictures. Now EasyBib, just to plug EasyBib, it does, I actually made this citation through the EasyBib tool. Uh, you can, um, you know, basically post uh, information um, to the form and get a good MLA citation for an image. So you can see that it really looks like another, any other citation um, for a web source where um, it, when it was retrieved and what website it's on. Um, and like I said, um, as it says at the bottom of the slide, that I really told the students they didn't really have to do the full citation, but just do a brief uh, citation. 
Um, okay, so this is an example of National Geographic. Um, I, I really shouldn't be using this um, picture because it's, it is, uh, has a lot of uh, restrictions at one time use. Um, but that's just, I, I, I'm sorry, I have timings on some of my slides I didn't plan on. Um, but uh, there's a lot of information that I got about the license that I needed to put in there. Okay, now this is a, um, a Creative Commons licensed picture with the citation that follows the Creative Commons guidelines. Okay, so the element, this is a proper citation according to Creative Commons. And what you have are really three requirements, and they're all links. Okay, this is important because in traditional citations, you don't really link. Um, on, when you're using web photos, the assumption is that they're also going to be on the web and that it's appropriate and proper to, to um, link to the photographer and to the picture's original source and the license uh, which tells you what it can be used for and how it can be used. Okay, so the, uh, the first thing here is the, the title of the picture, which is the Library of Congress. Hopefully you've had a chance to see the reading room in Washington, D.C. It's probably one of the most magnificent buildings anywhere. Um, the, the username, uh, this is a Flickr username of the photographer that took the picture. Um, and so this is a link to his photo stream on Flickr. And it'll, you know, so you can find out who that person is and what he or she wants to tell you about his or herself. Um, and then this is a license, um, which really is a code. And if you are familiar with Creative Commons, um, the, the language is Creative CC, Creative Commons. Um, is, um, the NC is, is um, I forget. And then sh SA is share alike, which means it can't be modified. And then the 2.0 is, is the license class. Okay, as I said, I'm not an expert on all. There's a lot of different Creative Commons licenses. Um, and they're very straightforward. Um, you can link, you can, by linking to the image, you can, the, to the license to the image, you can see, in fact, what restrictions there are on there. So this image is, is a share alike, which means that I can't Photoshop it and reuse it, but I can use it as long as I attribute it to the photographer and link to the photographer. Um, okay, one of the most important strategies when it comes to students is really to give them guidance in finding pictures. Now, without even saying anything uh, to our students, they're going to go to Google Images. So I am going to talk about Google Images. I'm going to show you some advanced search tools in Google Images. But these are some other ideas to point students in a certain direction when it comes to finding good pictures. Um, the first one I've already mentioned, Wikipedia or Wikimedia Commons, um, which again has terrific uh, open, mostly public domain images and that have full descriptions, uh, attributions, all the information you really need. Um, and oh, just so you know that Wikipedia, their pictures, when we use Google, a lot of those images, the public domain ones, will show up on Google as the top results. So really Google and Wikipedia work close together. Uh, Britannica is, is one thing that our school libraries have access to, and it has a um, Image Quest, which has millions of what they call rights cleared images. Uh, so these are Getty images and other um, stock photo companies and, um, and other public domains kind of mixed in. Um, and so that's a really good resource. And um, our schools pay for these things to be used. And so it's a great thing to do is to get, get them used. So tell students about these type of resources if you, your institution uh, subscribes to them. And then the last thing I'm going to mention, which I'll demo in a second, is Flickr. Um, Flickr is, um, is a photo sharing website, but it, it has, um, it's hardwired for Creative Commons licensing. Basically, every picture that's posted, the person sharing is going to be specifying a Creative Commons license. So it's very good uh, for, for most people in, in most subjects, and I'm going, to, I'm going to go on to that next. Okay, so as with Google, you really can't do much with the standard search. Okay, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo this. Let me see how I'm doing for time. I got, um, okay, I got some time. I, I'll, I'll do a little bit of demo on, on Flickr. And um, if you don't use advanced search, you really aren't going to be finding what you need. Um, and this is a screenshot of the advanced search page. And 
you'll, you'll see that the Creative Commons licensing is at the very bottom. On, on most computers, you're going to have to scroll down to see it. But it's like way down the page, and it's a little tiny checkbox when it, where it says you're only going to search Creative Commons license comment. So let me go to Flickr and, and um, show you. Um, I'll, just, I'll search for the Library of Congress photo that I uh, found um, yesterday. Um, okay, so we're going to do Library of Congress. Um, I'll look for, actually I'll look at a different picture. Um, okay, now this picture says all rights reserved, which means that it means just what it says, all rights reserved. So that's because I didn't do an advanced search. So let me go back and I'm going to click on advanced search. And then I'm going to show you that the little checkbox down at the bottom makes all the difference. If you don't, and your students are not going to notice this unless you tell them. So um, you can specify that it's, uh, you can be used commercially. But again, um, and if, if you want to Photoshop it or add or modify it, then you could check this box. But generally speaking, I don't do that. So I'm just going to search for things that are Creative Commons licensed. Um, okay, so there's the um, picture that I used in my presentation. Actually, it's not the same one, but it's very similar. Um, so there's the photographer. Uh, there's the some rights reserved. If you click on this, it's going to take you to the Creative Commons license that will show you that this is a uh, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, generic uh, license. Um, so again, that's what's great about Creative Commons is you get to do that. Um, and oh wait, where where's my? Okay, there we go. Um, with uh, Flickr, there's other things that you need to find that are not obvious, like the, if you click over here, you want to click on download all sizes. You can then specify if you want the full size, the large, the medium, or small. Uh, and these are really, um, this, I, I, later in my talk I'll talk about, you know, the appropriateness of different sizes. Uh, but I think that's one great thing about Flickr is that it, you, can, you can pick your image size and you can verify the licensing all on the website. And in many cases, you get um, a lot of description about the picture uh, that the photographer wrote. So you know when it was taken and you know what they're, they were thinking when they took it. Um, in the cases of National Geographic, uh, you'll see where I got the detailed licensing information that I cited. It was all from, from Flickr. So um, it, it has terrific metadata and uh, it's just such a great website that I think your students really need to know about it. Uh, especially when most of them are going to go to, to Google, they're, you know, this is a, is a great alternative to, to that. Okay, let's go back to my uh, slideshow. Um, okay, so this is what, um, a popular misconception. Why? When you are talking about Google and Flickr versus your class, one thing that, uh, th this is another misconception I should have added to my misconception list, was that really a lot of students just take images straight from Google Images, okay? But that, of course, is a problem. And what they really need to know is that Google is a search tool. It's not a source. So when they, you ask them where did you get the picture, an acceptable answer is not Google Images. Um, and that's, that's something that's hard to overcome. You're going to have to you know, really instill that in the students because that's, that is their go-to tool. Now, the, to contrast that with Flickr, um, it's an image library and a search tool, and it is a source that you can link to. So the links that I had from, from my presentation go straight to Flickr. Um, that shows where you got the picture from, who is the photographer. With Google, that's not appropriate, and, uh, and that's one thing that you have to really emphasize in your instruction. Okay, now, since the students already use Google, um, it's important that they know how to use it with the advanced search. So I'm guessing that a lot of you have seen this, but if you haven't, um, it's really important to know that there's a little box on the Google image search that ca is called search tools. If you click on that, a lot of great sorting features show up. In fact, you can find uh, photos of different sizes. You can find different file types, and you can also get licensing, um, licensed photos that are public domain. Um, and let me see if I get any other slide. Okay, let's go back. Okay, what I'm going to do is do a, sh a quick demo of Google Images. And 
And um, so let's just um, – I'll, I'll find the uh, Griffith Park Cougar that I've, I have in the next slide. Okay, so um, what I um, want to do with this is show you the search tools. As you, if you don't click on search tools, you don't see anything. Um, and then what you really want to emphasize first is usage rights. You want things that are labeled for reuse most likely. Um, actually, you could really specify any of these drop downs. Uh, they're all for, for education. They are generally all fine. And um, so these are the images that are licensed for reuse according to Google. Again, this may or may not be correct. Um, but if you um, look at these images, the, um, most of them are not going to be actually Wikipedia where I thought they would go. But in many cases, um, they're going to link to Wikipedia. Let me, uh, let me just find a more general topic on, let's just look at like uh, Ghana, which is a country we just played in the World Cup. Um, and we'll go to um, labels for use. And when you go to, uh, so, so when I, like I said, and for a lot of subjects what you happen to get are, um, if, if, if you follow the, the source, it's going to go to Wikipedia. Um, because as I said, Google, when it's looking for images that are okay to use, they're, they're going to bring you to the places they know are okay. And Wikipedia actually is a great source for images. So this is a map of Africa. If you click on it, um, you'll get um, some information about the map and um, who created it, where it came from, uh, and so forth. There's a lot of good metadata about the, uh, pictures, the pictures on Wikipedia. Again, that does not come through Google. That's the sources that Google links to. Um, so I could spend a lot of time going over the different permutations on Google, but um, I urge you, if you haven't done so, to play with it yourself since I have a limited amount of time. Um, so a few other things. Um, okay, so that really covers the, the, I would say, the instructional part of this presentation, that the things that, you, that are going to be most helpful to students. The next part of the presentation is really the last, which are we want to look at the big picture. Um, why, again, since, the, since photo sharing is, not, uh, the, the ethics are not always observed, you know, it's, 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 it sometimes seems futile. Um, but what I did for my class is I showed them the, the story behind the picture. This Griffith Park Cougar, uh, it's, the photographer Steve Winter spent over a year setting up, I'm sorry, my, I don't know why timings are on some slides and not others. Um, but okay, so this, this took a year to get, and there's a video on that slide, there's a link to the YouTube video uh, that shows how he got that picture. It's not Photoshopped. Um, but if you watch that video, I just shared that with the class and I said, listen, you know, this guy spent a year trying to get that picture and he put a lot of effort and money into that picture and National Geographic, you know, paid for it and they pay him to do this job and all you are asked to do as students is, is to cite that picture and give it proper credit. Uh, you know, so I think you have to make the moral argument. You have to, you know, be able to talk to students about, hey, this is why it's important. You know, there's, every picture you see on the Internet, somebody had to travel a long way. Uh, they had to maybe sometimes risk their lives. They might be a, in a war zone. Um, you know, they might have been, you know, threatened with, you know, being robbed or mugged or whatever just to get to where they got that picture. And, you know, so the very least you can do is just know who that person is and give them credit and link to their, you know, their information and give them the attribution that they ask for. It's really not too much to ask. So I think that's really the big picture. We want, we want students that are mindful. We want them to be attentive to um, what they're doing and not just mindlessly, you know, copy paste Google search and steal from Google without even visiting the website. So really that's what we're trying for. It's not so much the nitpicky details of citation and licensing. We just want them to be good people and to be mindful of, of the people that they rely on to do their work. Um, another thing that I think is really helpful um, about students is that they have to be mindful of the quality of the images. And so um, one thing I do in my job is I, I have the poster printer. And so um, obviously if the poster printer is going to print a large picture, the, the image resolution needs to be very good or it's going to look awful. And so 
um, as I showed you briefly on Google, you can specify large images as well as on Flickr, you have a filter where you can decide you know, if you want the large full size or if you want the smaller sizes. Um, and that's an important thing for the students to understand. Um, and that they don't, most students don't automatically look for this. So that's where you can be useful and really help them. Okay, so what I did here are really my own guidelines. Um, they're, they're really rough numbers. I don't, I don't know that they're firm numbers, but this is based on my experience that if you're going to print on a, 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 a poster, that really you, you need at least a, a file size of one megabyte. And you know, you also know how to find the file size in Windows or even on Mac. And that if it's uh, pixel width, it should be around oh 1,000, 1,200, or even higher. I mean, uh, some original, some really big pictures are going to print even better. You know, there's 2,400 pixel width, and you know, probably even larger. Um, but the larger for, for posters, really, the larger the better. Um, whereas when you're doing other audiovisual, like movies, for example, it can actually hinder you to use large file sizes, and that you're really shooting for maybe a medium-sized photo. Um, since movies are often shown on larger screens than web pages, it's a general rule that the student should look for um, medium sizes as opposed to for the web, which really you want the smallest size possible. That really, since it's going to be on a screen, often a mobile screen, then you know, the file size, the quality is really not at all that important. Okay, so just these are really the concluding thoughts that really, what are we aiming for? In, in this, we really want students that don't just, we want to produce you know, people that are ethical, that don't just mindlessly take from Google uh, and neglect attribution. Um, we want them to be participants in the Creative Commons. We want them to be successful people. Um, and um, you know, so there's nothing more effective at having them um, you know, do attribution than it is for them to put their work out there uh, so that other people can attribute to them. Um, so since Flickr is a very easy place to, you know, it's a community, you know, they can share their, their original work there. Um, at our school we have a lot of students that do Photoshop. And of course with Photoshop images you have to be careful about, you know, sharing them because they have to make sure that the original source uh, was licensed. But again, we want students to care about these things. And, um, and that's really um, what, what it's all about. Um, so, um, I really appreciate all of your, your time, and I really want to spend the rest of the time just you know, having a discussion and having everyone out there share some of your thoughts and comments. Of course, I'll try to answer questions, but I, by no means I, wanna, I don't want to say that I'm an authority on image licensing and so forth. Um, really here in this presentation, you're talking about a year of my work that I'm sharing with you, and I know you've all worked on different things, and I'm just kind of curious to know um, if your experiences match mine or if you have you know, some neat ideas or if you liked any of my ideas. So with that, I'll turn it over back to Emily and I look forward to hearing your comments. Cool. Thank you, Neil. Uh, that was a really great presentation and people have been very, very uh, chatty during today's session. It's been a very active uh, discussion which has been really great. Uh, there were a couple questions that came in which I'll just um, address now because they were asked uh, a few minutes ago. So if you would be so kind as to answer them and, uh, and then we can see what else is going on uh, in the chat. A lot of people are saying, um, you know, uh, nice work, really great presentation. Um, some people are also sharing links. Um, so before I get to the questions, I'll also let everyone else know we will uh, create a public document of today's chat log, and um, we will make sure to highlight all of the important links that people are sharing uh, today. Um, so one of the questions that came in, uh, Sandra asked, uh, Neil, do you do standalone lessons in using images, or do you include uh, the instruction that you've been talking about over the past year um, when a class comes in for research? So I guess more is part of like a, a one-shot session. Okay, good. Well, in my case, um, I worked at, uh, I did last year work at a, pri uh, a um, project based learning high school. Um, and one of the projects was called Evening for Africa. And, um, and this is a tradition of the school. It's a kind of a capstone experience for our freshman class. Um, and I was most concerned about our freshmen learning from the teacher that I quoted that, you know, you don't have to attribute because this was a public event. It was, a, we call it Project Share. The students were presenting to the general public and their parents. And I thought it was real important to have, um, 
you know, better attribution on those pictures. And um, so uh, in, that, in the case of the freshmen, I, I specifically wanted to address Evening for Africa. Um, so you'll see a lot of my examples had, you know, African countries in them, and that's because that's what I did. Um, so it was a very specific targeted um, outcome that we were looking for, just that they would, would attribute um, their pictures that came from Africa, some from dangerous parts of Africa that the photographers may have been in a, you know, a very risky situation, and we wanted, you know, to them to understand the life of a photographer. So, I, you know, that's what I did, and, and I, you know, I was able to have a more effective, I think, lesson because of that. Um, and then the Kennedy stuff was also um, really, uh, it was all part of a project that was on the conspiracy theories surrounding um, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, so in both cases that I've used today, they were very specifically tied to uh, projects. Awesome. Um, we have another question from Lucy. Uh, she asked, many educators and college professors believe that Wikipedia is not a reliable source. Uh, how do I justify using their images? And uh, Ian, uh, just to sort of fill you in with what other people are contributing, Ian said um, you could have them go to the original source of the image that Wikimedia Commons had listed um, and have them evaluate that instead. So if you have any comments on that. Yeah, um, well certainly, yes. Um, as I mentioned, I think, the, I think Wiki, Wikimedia Commons has excellent documentation. I, and I, I think that we have to get over some of our reservations. I, and I don't like all elements of Wikipedia, um, but I thought they're, they're just their documentation on photo and the licensing and the, the, you know, had all the, the data that you really could ask for. Um, and I believe it to be reliable. And um, so I'm, I mean, I'm relying on it, and I, I could certainly pick other sources, but uh, I really, I think very highly of, of the Wikimedia Commons. And I think, you know, they, I think once they see how extensive it is and how well documented it is, they should change their mind. Uh, we have um, one other question that uh, Kathy just dropped in, and some of the other people um, agree uh, that it's something, I guess it's a question that has been on many of their minds. Uh, she says, what do you suggest students do when they find an image, uh, let's say on another blog, that they want to use, but the image on that blog is not cited correctly? Um, do you allow them to use it? Well, like I said, I, I think there's so much of the, um, you know, sharing and, you know, taking uh, without permission that it really becomes hard to prevent. Um, you know, this, this is the society, the world we live in is, is become very freewheeling about it. Um, I don't think, it, like in education settings, I think you can set higher standards, um, and you just hope that they transfer to their practice in the real world. And um, you know, that's all really we can do. Um, I, I think in, in most cases, I don't think the teachers really care, and and that's the that's what I felt um, working where I do. And I think I try to draw the line. Um, really when it comes to a, a public, you know, event where, you know, the kids are sharing with the general public, um, then it becomes, I think, more urgent uh, to do it. Um, whereas opposed to, you know, just submitting work, it, obviously it, it's a victimless crime and nobody knows about it. Um, I don't think that makes it right. I think it's just better to instill good habits. But being realistic, you know, it's, you know librarians are not the most powerful people and, you know, it's hard to, to stop it from happening. That's great feedback. And we have had a, a couple other people um, answer that question as well just uh, within the chat box. Um, one person said um, another thing that they could do is they can download the image and then drop it into Google Image Search. And uh, to the participants, if you don't know, at Google Images you can upload a picture um, and you can search that image uh, to find related images as well. Um, and another person also said, um, you know, when I'm working with students on using images in research, I suggest that they not really fall in love with an image before they check to make sure that it's available. Um, and then, you know, in many cases, rarely uh, will only one image suit a project. So if they see a picture that they are really hung up on, chances are they'll be able to find something very similar that is licensed under Creative Commons, for example. Right, and that's a really good point because that's really, I would call that persistence versus, you know, that's the outcome we want. We want them to persist through, you know, just the first initial result in the quick scan that they always do and to go a, a step further. And, you know, I think that's really the heart of the issue. 
One comment uh, that just came in from uh, Sandra, she said, um, I mean, you've been talking about using Flickr and Google Images and all of these huge repositories of photos um, that are often out on the open web. And she asks, um, you know, is it like wrong of me to sort of insist that students use uh, databases like ImageQuest or other database images so that they can cite it properly? And she works uh, with much younger students. She says that she's working uh, with sixth graders and younger. So I don't know if you have had any experience, Neil, uh, with that, or if anyone else in the chat has had experience working with younger students on that. Um, no, I don't have. But again, I do think, of course, that you know, when this institution pays for stock photography and other repositories, that is obviously we want them to use those resources. And often, I think you know, their environments are very predictable and, and good for sh for smaller kids. You know, they you know, whereas the websites are more complicated, I think than say Britannica. I think Britannica is more suitable for the younger audiences and other, I'm sure there are other you know, subscription tools out there that are also a little bit simpler that simplify the citation as well. Right. Um, and also just, uh, I'm sure many of you have already seen this in the chat, but Neil, uh, for your knowledge, um, Rebecca contributed a link which we'll include in the follow-up email as well. Uh, she says, if you do a Google search for the University System of Georgia and Fair Use, um, there's a checklist that comes up that will help you um, sort of compare each situation of when it's appropriate to use an image or not uh, in terms of copyright and fair use and things like that. So we'll make sure to include that um, in the, in the follow-up email as well. Um, just some of the other um, questions and comments that are coming in. Um, earlier on, uh, Judy had said, you know, you were talking about how students and some teachers too just don't understand how to use uh, images at all uh, in research. And Judy says, I think many people do not understand uh, copyright law and fair use. And Peggy uh, added on to that and she said, that's definitely true, especially fair use uh, and transformative use as well. So you're definitely not alone uh, with that in terms of encountering students and teachers who have a lack of understanding about that. Okay, good. And um, let's just see what else is coming in through the chat. Many grateful uh, comments that are coming in. Um, one person, uh, Mary Alice had asked, uh, when you were talking about royalty-free um, images, she just wanted to clarify that royalty-free kind of almost means the opposite of what it sounds like, where the photographer doesn't get any financial benefit, but uh, the provider like Getty Images does. Is that correct? Well, you know, I, I, well, stock photo companies definitely compensate their photographers. And um, I'm not sure of the details of how that's done, but certainly one way photographers make money is by selling to stock photo, stock photo companies. So. Okay, great. Um, and then another person asked, where do you, where do you send teachers and students um, for this kind of information that is essentially much of the content that you've shared with us today um, if they haven't seen this webinar? So clearly it's been very informative for everyone here, but uh, for those who haven't seen it, how do you uh, inform teachers of the various rules and workarounds for using images appropriately in research? Um, well, um, I, um, I, will, I will refer them to, um, first of all, the Creative Commons information that's cited here on the bibliography. Um, and also every um, commercial website, um, educational website like National Geographic and many others, they all have terms of use about how you can use the content on their website. And I, I just think mindful behavior means reading reading that legal information if you're concerned about it. So, you know, first they have to be concerned. Uh, you know, first they, you want them to care, and then they have to know where to look. So, um, and uh, so just understanding Creative Commons licensing and just the general, you know, restrictions on things that are common by different organizations um, is, is just important. And, and uh, you know, uh, I have a lot of sources here. A lot of them refer to Creative Commons and I, I obviously, I think it's something we should need to promote. Creative Commons is a very idealistic initiative, and um, I just want to help it, you know, thrive. I want to promote awareness of it. So that's why I'm kind of emphasizing it here. I, I think that's just what we need to talk about. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there are Creative Commons is definitely coming becoming more, I guess, ubiquitous as the years go on. They have obviously with Flickr, they have that great partnership for finding um, those images, and it is um, a really great resource that I don't think enough uh, people know about, really. Um, so that seems to be all of the questions. Um, we have some other comments coming in. Um, one, per Debbie Andrews uh, contributed. Uh, her, what they've been doing in their classroom. She says, we use data, uh, databases plus we teach them how to use images that are found on the web. Um, when the students are using the databases for images and note when they find it, uh, they seem to be happier with their results. So interesting that they're using both types, both the open web and the invisible web, and they actually, students have uh, better outcomes when they're using uh, the databases instead. Good, okay. And um, some other people are, are submitting comments here. Uh, this topic might be a good easy bib YouTube video. That is a great uh, suggestion, Kate and Kathy. Um, we will, we're going to be working all over the summer, uh, throughout the summer, to create new content for the easy bib blog. And uh, we will put that at the top of the list because just from uh, the positive reaction that we've gotten from Neil's uh, presentation, it's something that clearly is uh, of need. We do have something on our blog right now um, that I will drop into the chat box that kind of helps students uh, figure out how they should be um, citing images when uh, found in research. We have it under this page called uh, Frequent Citation Questions, and it's essentially just a lot of uh, questions that we get in on the help desk. And instead of answering the same question uh, time and time again, we put them up on this blog. Um, so I'm going to drop the link into the chat box right now. So you can see um, if you open up the Frequent Citation Questions page, there is one where it's how do I cite a picture found on Google Images. We provide a very brief overview, but I definitely agree that we could uh, expand upon that a little bit more. So definitely keep an eye out for that um, in the coming weeks and months. Um, Cool. So uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat box now. Uh, Neil and I will hang on the line for a few more minutes, but we are approaching the top of the hour. Um, so again, thank you to everyone uh, who took the time uh, to join us today. And many thanks to you, Neil, uh, for your great presentation. It's been really informative. And this is definitely one of the most active um, webinars that we've had as of late. So you've definitely sparked a lot of discussion. And uh, we really appreciate you helping us out with this. Well, great, and I really appreciate some of the things I've heard from the audience as well. So it's great to be a part of it, and then I think that's why I do these things is because I, I enjoy communing with people of my own kind, and um, you know, it, it means a lot. Awesome. Um, so yeah, again, just to everyone, uh, you will be receiving a certificate of completion if you attended the live event, and uh, we will be sending a follow-up email that will have tons of resources. Uh, it will have the slides. It will have the recording, um, as well as all of the resources that you've shared today during the session. So um, thank you again, everyone. If any of you are going to be at ALA or ISTE uh, in the coming weeks, we will be there. I will be at ALA, um, and my, some of my other lovely colleagues will be at ISTE. So if you're going to Vegas or Atlanta anytime soon, make sure to stop by the EasyBib booth um, and let us know what you think about our PD series. Um, so thanks again everyone, and uh, we will see you uh, in July for the next PD series. Have a great day. All right. Thanks everybody.